Well, after uh, three days of parties, uh, I can see people are going to be straggling in for a while, but uh, I think I'll get started. The uh, title of this talk was Flexible Networking at Large Scale, but I think people have different ideas of just what large scale is. Uh, some people having a 50-node cluster or a 100-node cluster or something they might aspire to and consider large. Uh, but Yahoo is a little bigger than that. So what we're actually talking about is a mega scale. So what I mean by mega scale is lots of compute nodes, lots and lots of VMs, and lots and lots of network bandwidth, and lots and lots of traffic between tenants as well as from tenants. It's not everyone facing out, pumping data out into the greater world. It's lots of things talking to each other and then coming up with something that they project out into the great beyond. So our goals in accommodating megascale, three goals, probably goals we all have, but at megascale, things are a bit different. We need reliability. I mean, Yahoo is large. Depending upon who you ask, we're between the first and fourth in terms of page views on the web. We need flexibility. We essentially, not only do we have many properties that uh, supporting what our CEO calls the daily habits things like news, sports, weather, and so on. People come to depend on those. We need reliability as well as, as scale. We need flexibility. These daily habits are supported by many subsystems. Um, there are lots of things behind that having to do with serving advertising and various other things. And then we need to keep things as simple as possible. Problem is, is you can come up with lots of complex systems, but the bigger you go with scale, the harder it happens. It's, it's not linear as you scale larger. So we try to keep things as simple as possible as we grow it. So our strategy is come up with a highly performant network backbone that everything plugs into. We use OpenStack. OpenStack is at, this, is at the middle of this so far as providing all the compute resources. We augment that with automation. Unfortunately, a lot of this is external to uh, OpenStack, in part because we already have many systems in existence. We've been around for 19 years. We've accreted a lot of management uh, systems and so on. We have to integrate with those. They sometimes do jobs that uh, are appropriate to our scale. Um, it may not otherwise be common. And then we design our systems so that they're made of components that are essentially disposable. And what I mean by that is any given VM can, be, can go out of existence at a, at a moment's notice. Now, it's something we already achieve because we have to have reliability and we have to have scale. So the tendency is you have many, many computers all doing the same task and there are going to be failures and the software is designed to accommodate those. So moving that into OpenStack, into, the, into a cloud is facilitated because Th there is no problem with having a VM go down. Um, so it's, and we leverage that in terms of providing our flexibility. So, and we also have a lot of uh, systems management infrastructure and so on that we've created. And by bringing that in to OpenStack, as, as, I, will, as I will talk about, um, we find that we already have a lot of the pieces that are necessary. Now, 
When you're small scale, and I'm sure Yahoo was like this back in the 1990s, um, your networks are very simple. It's a layer two design. It's essentially a wire with intelligence. I mean, Ethernet was originally, back in the old days, just one long cable with, with transducers plugged into it. And that model grew as we created switches and, and other equipment. Um, but nonetheless, it's a wire with intelligence. That makes it relatively cheap to build, fairly easy to manage. It allows a great flexibility of solutions. And that's not necessarily a good thing uh, as you grow. Um, you have issues with things like broadcast storms and so on. Once you grow larger and larger, people leverage things like multicast that can only scale in to, to a particular size. Various other issues when you rely on having a layer two domain seem to emerge. But it's, off, it's often the way people start out. And of course, once you have a system on the ground, you want to grow it. Uh, so by simply making the wire longer and longer and longer, you, f you continue to scale until you finally reach a point where something melts down. Now, in the cloud world, one of the advantages of, of course, having an a large layer two domain is if you're doing things like live migration, various other techniques of, uh, of uh, combining your, your uh, compute resources. Uh, you have IP mobility. You, an IP can move to any hypervisor on your system without issue. So it's conceptually simple, but it has limits, and we've discovered long ago some of those limits. Um, and just a couple of them. Now, as, as an aside, I am a software person. I am not a network person. Uh, I've started with OpenSAC. I was a, I was a C++ programmer for 20 years, <laughs> and, and then got into the, the, the clouds. Um, so my networking folks tell me that there are limitations with the hardware, there are limitations with the various management protocols within the L2 domain, and there are other issues which I already mentioned, things like um, limited uh, um, is issues with, with um, broadcasts and other, other network phenomenon as it grows. Now, if you go to a layer three network, a lot of those problems go away because essentially you've partitioned off a bunch of L2 domains. Uh, you don't have the sorts of issues of large L2 domains. But of course, you've limited your flexibility. Now, there are some potential solutions, and there are probably a dozen vendors here that will provide them or in one way or another. One of, the, one of the big hot ones now is make a software defined network, simulate an L, a larger L2 domain on top of an L3 domain. Um, one of the ways of doing that is you do an overlay, so you encapsulate all your packets and that's uh, um, that creates some issues as you scale larger because you're creating a large control plane. If you have network issues, um, if, if your network gets partitioned, you can wind up with big trouble. Um, and we've, although we've done some experimentation with software-defined networking, um, we can't really grow it as big as we need to for megascale. Um, there are other solutions that don't necessarily involve encapsulation, um, but once again, we don't think they're quite there yet, at least, at least not for our purposes. So our solution is to come up with as big a uh, L3 backplane as we can produce. Now, at 
this sort of scale, the new hotness is to use what's called a close design. It's named after a fellow named Charles Close, who uh, developed a way of interconnecting telephone switches back in the 1950s. And this was recently rediscovered by networking folks. Uh, and it's basically an interconnection matrix that allows you to, to scale to almost arbitrary size and yet allow up to line rate from any port to any port. So along with this, as, or as part of this, each cabinet of hypervisors is its own subnet, its own, its own L2 domain. Now that's, as I said before, res that's restrictive in some ways. But that also gives us our advantages, as we'll see. Because this is such a high bandwidth backplane, then we support our needs so far as having massive east-west as well as north-south traffic. I mean, we pump out an awful lot of data, but all that data has gone through processing as it passes from node to node before it gets pumped out. So there's a, um, the, the fact that we have a very high bandwidth backplane is quite useful. Also, if we do get, go into an overlay solution later and we continue to look into that, uh, we will already have an ideal backplane to put that overlay onto. So this kind of gives you a picture of what it looks like. Um, everything is more or less connected to everywhere. Um, by the way, the, the, there are a number of areas here I am not talking about that problems that we solve, things like, well, how do you do network security with this kind of a setup? I'm not going to touch those. We are, we are working on it. Uh, but uh, we're, we're most in this talk, we're mostly dealing about bandwidth. This also allows us to add greater robustness because everything is nicely distributed. Um, we use availability zones, as I'm, as I'm sure a lot of our uh, larger OpenStack users do. Um, our experience is that things tend to fail along power distribution units, and so we try to spread things between them so that uh, we can have a power failure and wind up with, with sufficient capacity to continue. Well, of course there are problems with going layer three. There's no IP mobility. Um, if you actually needed to move a VM from one hypervisor to another, and that hypervisor happens to be in another rack, um, well, the IP address has to change. And we are actually are working on ways of doing that, but we don't want to. Um, because much of our application stack is written in such a way that it can be terminated and restarted harmlessly. Um, we don't think we're, we have to do this much, but there definitely will be cases, uh, especially having to do with maintenance and so on, where we might want to move stuff around. Um, so we're, we are working on ways of doing migration and simultaneously having the VM change its IP if necessary. So this also brings in some complexity, some things OpenStack is not quite set up to deal with yet. Uh, those have to do with things like implementing rack awareness, since, since each rack is a its own subnet. Um, as IP addresses are assigned to VMs, obviously that needs to factor into that. Um, so, and there are other issues that come up, and you, you can imagine what those are. So this doesn't sound very flexible, and admittedly, we've had to give up a lot of 
flexibility. I think if, uh, if those of you who work for public cloud providers are saying that this is like, this, is, this would be a nightmare, because after all, every VM is precious. Well, we can't, we can't work that way. So what we do and what, we've, what we have long done, but we're integrating OpenStack into this process, is we use load balancing everywhere. Um, obviously, no one machine is going to handle well, practically any given situation. So just about everything internally and externally lives behind a VIP. And what we are doing is we are integrating that existing capability with OpenStack. So when you're sitting behind a VIP, your IP is irrelevant. I mean, as long as the load balancer knows how to get to you. So, so VMs can come up, VMs can go down. As long as you coordinate that with your load balancers, um, from the VIP's perspective, nothing has changed. So as I said, we already do this. We do this not just for scale, but we do it for high availability. And in fact, we use load balancers within OpenStack control plane itself. So OpenStack has, as, as I showed back here, our, the control nodes for OpenStack are also in their own availability zones. Um, as a, so, and of course, we use load balancing to uh, provide that high, avail high availability. Now, the third component to this is we've, we've produced a concept that we call service groups. Now, a service group is essentially a bunch of VMs behind a VIP. Um, that's, that's one way of looking at it. It's a group of, of uh, VMs that implement some sort of a service, some logical component of, uh, of our stack. Now, at this point, we are implementing them external to OpenStack because there, there just isn't quite the leverage within OpenStack to do this, not quite the tools. Um, also, because admittedly, we have a, a lot of infrastructure external to OpenStack that we have to integrate with. I mean, as I said, 19 years of, of legacy to deal with here. So, as I said, a service group, a group of VMs behind a VIP, they're all running the same application. Any one VM could, could evaporate and things will continue to run. Um, so they implement a web service API. We have web services everywhere. Every, every, all of our components implement or implemented as a web service. We kind of got the, the REST web service religion a number of years ago, and it, it has been very helpful in terms of integrating, integrating things and making it easy for developers. So the basic idea is somebody creates a service group as, as, uh, as we uh, create one of our um, products, the necessary service groups are set up. That gives things like the necessary resources to support it, um, how much load balancing is going to be required, you know, what's the maximum number of IPs that are going to be set behind the VIP. Um, and so we have an, a, uh, we, so we have an external system that takes care of that. Um, it, it works, creates a unique tag that's associated with those resources. And then when we integrate that with OpenStack, what happens is when a request for resources is done, either by a user, or in this case, I guess it would be an administrator for a particular project, 
or an application framework that is performing a function such as elasticity, where um, you know we're growing and shrinking a cloud, or, or depending upon uh, the demands of the moment. I mean, think of oh, I don't know, something like March Madness uh, for sports or some big news event or, you know, the holiday rush or something like that. Thing, things tend to be cyclical, but sometimes unexpected things happen as well. Elasticity is very important to us, and we're leveraging OpenStack to implement that. So... After the, a request passes through the front end... A call is made to the Nova API, just as on, on the appropriate cluster. That tag is attached to it, that unique identifier. And that passes through as the instances are allocated. But at the moment, late in that process, where the network is, or the IP address in particular, is selected, for that instance, that tag is then passed back into the external system. The external system recognizes the service group. Because it's been given the IP address, it's able to inform the load balancers that this VM is coming up and it's part of this service group, so it's going to be associated with this VIP. Um, and then the process goes on. And as, as you'll see, this, by using this association to control the load balancers, uh, we create a rather seamless way of adding and removing resources um, as needed. Um, The way we have done this is there are three points of integration with OpenStack, as you have you as you've seen. We have our front end integration where requests are processed prior to being fed to OpenStack. We have the integration at that one point in instant instance creation where the IP address is finally known. And then the third is when a VM is actually shut down, we also need to inform the system at that point so it's removed from the VIP and uh, so forth. So we've patched OpenStack. Um, essentially patched it at only network, essentially instance creation and instance deletion. Um, we've also patched it so that the subnet, so that uh, scheduling is subnet aware, so that when an instance is brought up on a particular hypervisor, the pool of IPs available to that hypervisor is the source of the IP. Okay. So in doing all this, what is our relationship to OpenStack? What are we trying to do here? Well, we are trying to minimize the amount of patching. There are some things we're doing, integrating with Nova Network or Neutron, at the point of IP address assignment, for example, is something, that's a point where I think a lot of people want to integrate with their systems because they have external systems, need to track VMs, need to track the IP of VMs. Um, other people may want to do similar things with, with uh, load balancing as we are. Um, so we want to eliminate the amount of patching, maybe provide plugins, maybe provide a, a tagging mechanism. Uh, in fact, we are, we are uh, talking with, with uh, other folks um, who have similar 
issues who are doing similar things with L3 top of rack that we are um, using tagging for network selection. So that's something that uh, um, there actually is a blueprint out there uh, from eBay. Um, we're working with them. We're talking to other people. Because this is a very com as you get to mega scale, this is very common to do this kind of L3 uh, breakup. So, contribute, replace a lot of our custom um, external pieces with as much of community code as we can. Use things like Heat and perhaps Congress for automation. Um, eventually, integrate with Elbas. Um, and, of course, continue to share our experiences. So one of us will probably be up in front talking to you again next conference or conference after that and telling you how this is all going. So there are, of course, a lot of complications that anyone trying to do mega scale encounters. Uh, OpenStack clusters don't exist in a vacuum. Um, there are all you have lots of external systems. You have issues of, uh, um, well, frankly, it tends to get into politics and other things. You have different organizations that need to work with the OpenStack, with the OpenStack group. It's quite different than in, in a public cloud because um, essentially, you really are a service, but you're a service to your own company. Um, so I've pretty much reached the end, um, which, will give, which will give time for questions. Um, anyone who wants to know more about this, uh, remember the proviso. I'm a software guy. If you ask me anything very deep about networking, uh, I'll just shrug my shoulders or something. Uh, so, the takeaway is that there are a lot of unique issues as you grow out to mega scale. You're dealing with things in large aggregations. You're not dealing with one-on-one -on -one sorts of sorts of things. So, you can't, as, as I said at the outset, and this is this I consider this to be key. You have to keep pushing towards simplicity because complexity doesn't scale. <laughs> now, but one of the nice things, as we've seen, create, creating this large backbone, something that you wouldn't do at a smaller scale, mega scale allows us to, to do that and do that in a cost effective way. So, Recovering our flexibility is a matter of doing better automation and replacing or integrating with external um, management infrastructure. So, all right. Uh, come, come to the mic, please. I'm guessing you found queuing mechanisms as a good conduit for configuration. I'm just wondering which queuing services you considered, for example, Rabbit versus Zero MQ. Uh, we use Rabbit. Um, however, I mean, we, we do recognize that um, the message queue is one of the big limiting factors in growing a cluster. Um, however, we support multiple clusters, and one of the things that our external automation takes care of um, is um, the interaction between those clusters. So, yeah. Hi. Um, is your smallest layer three subnet at the rack level or at the hypervisor level? So you mentioned that you have IP mobility within the rack. Yes. That, okay. We do. Yeah, and uh, that. Um, and we employ that. If there's hard, if say hardware is showing signs of failing within the rack, we can move, migrate off of that particular hypervisor to another within a rack. But oftentimes, especially when we're doing upgrades, 
um, you know, the entire rack is going to have to transition. And so in that case, if we happen to have valuable VMs on there, and like I said, we try and avoid that if, if at all possible, then we would have to re-IP it as we move it to another cabinet. Um, and that, that's tricky. We've only just started experimenting with that because um, it basically involves all, involves shut it, shutting down and snap and uh, shutting down and modifying the, the image or some other trick. And you know, it's live migration at this point we aren't even looking at, but we are looking at migrating VMs, changing their IP. Um, if they contain valuable state. And within the rack, how are you doing the live migration? Is it block level live migration or shared storage? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not shared storage. It's evil. Yes. Yeah. If, if oh, it's a, okay. Stringer, yeah. one of our ops Sorry, the reason that we don't use shared storage uh, mainly is because if you were to break out of a VM on the hypervisor, you would actually have access to uh, a, a shared resource. So effectively, you could uh, do nasty things to a lot of hypervisors. So yeah, we're not using shared storage. So when you're migrating within the rack, it's then block level live migration? Yes. OK. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering uh, what kind of complexity you have encountered with the overlay experiment. Can you elaborate in detail and uh, what uh, specific area you like to see improvement in those overlay networks to meet your mega scale need? Yeah. You'll have to speak up. I have a very loud uh, air conditioner vent right above my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question is uh, uh, the specifics uh, uh, that you have encountered when experimenting the overlay network in your mega scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, what aspect that you like to see the uh, to improve? To improve in OpenStack. O overlay networks. Oh, overlay you mentioned overlay net oh, networks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the one of the issues with uh, with overlays is that once you reach a particular size, you start running into, um, and by size, I act, I am talking about the kind of mega scale size we're ta we're talking about. Um, when, when we ask vendors about supporting a thousand IPs at this kind of bandwidth, it's like, well, they're not quite, they're not quite there yet. So, um, I want to make clear we're not rejecting overlay as a solution. We're just saying that right now it would limit our scale. And so, um, but issues with, Behavior, if a network is partitioned, can it recover from that? Various other issues. Um, we've, we want to see a little more experience in the community with, with overlays and with their characteristics before, before we try and scale them as big as we would need them. So, um, but I think they're getting there. <laughs> I mean, some point in the future. Yes. So here, here comes a network question. Yeah. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> have you looked at or do you have any interest in dynamic route injection out of the VMs into the network to move IPs around? Um, explain to me what you mean by dynamic route so, injection. And I might be able to answer your question. <laughs> you, you mentioned that moving a VM from one rack to another requires you to re-IP the VM because it lives in a different layer three domain. Yes. Routing protocol injection would allow you to move that IP address anywhere in the data center <coughs> without re-IPing anything. You just have to get a gateway to ideally probably use BGP to inject the routes to the network yeah. to move yeah. them around. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, I think that one of the problems with that is it adds a lot of state and complexity to the network. Um, it's, it's a solution, but it's a solution to a problem we're trying to avoid. <laughs> so, um, 
Okay. We haven't haven't really looked into that. I don't think, other than to say that. We're just discussing that. Yeah. <laughs> we should talk later. Okay. But. Right. Ask me next time. <laughs> what networking service are you using? Nova Network or Neutron? We are, okay. We are using Nova Network. Um, our experience and our read on the community is that Neutron does not yet scale sufficiently. And there may be HA issues. Um, under stress, Neutron has a tendency to uh, lock up, we have heard. Um, We've only done a modest amount of experimentation with Neutron. We know that's the future. Um, we hope they get there. We would like them to get there quickly. Uh, but right now, we're, we're integrated with Nova Network. Are you able to talk a little bit more about the, the patches that you use? I mean, are you, you said to open, patch OpenStack. What, yeah. what services are, are you patching? Are you patching Nova Scheduler? and, and um, are those patches publicly available on GitHub? Are you working those patches back to the community? Um, the, w the way that we're currently doing it is we've monkey patched um, network API. And so when allocate, for instance, I mean, if you're familiar with the code, allocate, for instance, deallocate, for instance, essentially those touch our infrastructure, I mean, they call out, touch our infrastructure, inform it of what's going on, get a read back from the infrastructure, and then the, inst the instance creation is, is uh, completed from there. So those patches are proprietary at this point. We would like to have an architecture that allows us to plug in that sort of thing and just not do monkey patching or any of that kind of stuff. But Right now, that, that is actually the main change that we've made. It's actually, it's actually a relatively simple patch um, that it calls to a bunch of our own Python code from those, from those two functions. So, Okay, we are just about done, I think. Um, maybe one more question. All right, oh, okay, he's just sitting down. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs>